the Australian Law Reform Commission, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all here. First, I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather and pay my respects to their elders. The Honourable Michael Kirby, ACCMG, Judges of the Federal Court of Australia, of the Supreme Court of Queensland and the District Court of Queensland, Chairman of the New South Wales Law Reform Commission, Mr Alan Cameron, AO, and of the Victorian Law Reform Commission, the Honourable Tony North, Mr Ian Anderson, Deputy Secretary of the Attorney General's Department, and all distinguished guests. It's with great pleasure that I welcome you today to the launch of the ALRC's report on the future of law reform, a suggested program of work for 2020 to 2025. This project stems from comparative research undertaken into how other jurisdictions, both nationally and internationally, handle the ever pressing need for aspects of the law to be reviewed in order to determine whether, and if so how, an area of law is ripe for reform. Our statute does not provide the ALRC with the ability to self-refer matters for inquiry, but it does empower the ALRC to make recommendations to government. In 2019, we decided to embark on a national conversation to assist us with reviewing the current law with a view to making recommendations to government as to areas which might be fruitfully the subject of an ALRC inquiry. The methodology for holding the national conversation is explained in chapter one of the report. Broadly, it involved research, preliminary research by our own staff of recent and publicly available suggestions for law reform in Australia, comments by courts in cases at all levels and across the country, and publicly available suggestions for law reform advanced by other jurisdictions. Selection criteria by which to assess appropriate topics were also arrived at and publicised. We then invited public submissions by way of an online survey to which we received just over 400 responses. <coughs> we held public seminars on particular focus topics in conjunction with partner organisations in Sydney with UNSW on public law reform, in Canberra with the ANU on technology and the law, in Melbourne and live streamed around the country with the University of Melbourne on constitutional and immigration issues, and here in Brisbane on energy resources and environmental law. We also consulted with state and territory law reform bodies about potential areas for cooperative law reform projects and were gratified in particular by the detailed contribution of the Victorian Law Reform Commission. We are also particularly grateful to the many academics, government and industry representatives, members of the legal profession and members of the public, indeed many of you who are in this room today, who gave so generously of your time and expertise to contribute to this project. And so we have arrived at the suggested program of work set out in this report and about which you will hear a little more shortly. I stress that this is only a suggestion to government. Matters referred to the ALRC are ultimately entirely within the discretion of the Attorney General. But we hope that the depth of work done in arriving at this suggested program will be of assistance to the Attorney and to his department in weighing up potential topics for inquiry when the time comes for consideration of such matters. I would like particularly to acknowledge and thank the extraordinary work of our Principal Legal Officer, Mr Michael Payton, who has led this project with such a plomb, ably assisted by the whole ALRC team. Thank you very much, Michael. But first, it is my great pleasure to invite the Honourable Michael Kirby, AC, CMG, to launch the report. There is much that could be said about Mr Kirby by way of biographical introduction, but this audience already knows him very well. He is a frequent and welcome visitor to Queensland. Prior to his appointment to judicial office, first as a judge of the Federal Court of Australia in 1983, then as president of the New South Wales Court of Appeal in 1984, and ultimately as a justice of the High Court of Australia in 1996, Mr Kirby was the chairman of the ALRC, indeed its inaugural chairman from 1975 to 1984. In that capacity, he laid the foundation for how the ALRC should go about its work. He spoke 
of the effective approach to law reform as an approach that involves an understanding of the operation of black letter law in society generally, and therefore of the importance of gathering the views of all relevant stakeholders, including the public, and obtaining the insights of relevant disciplines other than law. He said that effective law reform demanded a methodology that valued full and open consultation, public meetings, harnessing of policy, and publication of draft papers. It is on this firm foundation that we at the ALRC felt confident now to embark upon this project, following the principles established by its first chairman, who I now invite to address us. Turn to the scene of the crime, as it were, <laughs> uh, so many years after I began in those heady days of 1975. Uh, the Whitlam government was in office. Marlon Murphy was the Federal Attorney General. Uh, the uh, commissioners included uh, the Honourable Gareth Evans uh, and uh, Sir Gerard Brennan. Uh, John Kane, later the, the Premier of Victoria, uh, Alex Castles, uh, a wonderful and original um, Australian legal historian, uh, and Gordon Hawkins. Uh, we were the original commissioners. And it's therefore a very great compliment um, and perhaps a little foolhardy of the President to invite me to come along uh, and uh, to speak in support of the launch uh, of this suggested program which uh, has been produced by the ALRC and which it is my duty to launch as I now do in case I forget <laughs> to do it later on. <laughs> um, uh, the, the approach to law reform uh, in Australia uh, really copied many of the errors of the English uh, in the reform of the law. Uh, but in the 19th century, uh, a number of very great law reformers were at work uh, in England. Um, they worked on proposals for the reform of the law in India, then the jewel in the crown of the British Empire. Uh, and they produced uh, reports on penal law, the Penal Code of India of 1860, uh, on the law of ed evidence, uh, on the law of contract, uh, and on uh, the law of uh, marriage. Uh, and uh, they were magnificent works of deep law reform, which were produced by very fine uh, English legal scholars for the purpose of the government of India. Uh, they were treated with disdain uh, in uh, Britain where attempts were made to have them uh, adopted uh, in the House of Commons, but um, as was said at the time, Judge and Co opposed these proposals for uh, law reform, but the Indians embraced them um, with great enthusiasm. The work of uh, Thomas Babington Macaulay and James Fitzjames Stephen uh, still live today in India, in Pakistan, uh, in Bangladesh, uh, and in Sri Lanka. And uh, it was soon to be picked up uh, in Malaya, uh, in uh, the other areas of the British Empire, in Asia, uh, throughout Africa, throughout the Caribbean, uh, and everywhere today the monuments of 19th century law reform uh, in um, the English-speaking world can be seen. Of course there were still matters that needed further reform, including Section 377 of the Indian Penal Code, 
which is the provision that was copied through virtually every uh, colony of uh, the British Empire criminalizing uh, sex by homosexuals. Uh, so it wasn't all beautiful, but it was certainly distinctive, it was efficient, uh, and uh, as I've said, it's still in force. In Australia, um, as you'll see in the early editions of the Australian Law Journal, um, there were constant complaints about the state of the law and calls for a more systematic approach to law reform, but nothing much was done until the English finally returned to the systematic examination of their legal system for England and Scotland, uh, and in 1965 uh, established the Law Commissions, which became a model that was copied in Australia. It was copied in uh, New South Wales, uh, and I'm very pleased to see my friend Alan Cameron here, the president of the NSWLRC, uh, and uh, it was copied in Queensland, it was copied uh, in other states of Australia, and it was copied eventually uh, in Victoria, and I'm delighted that uh, the Honourable Tony North is here fresh from laying down his judicial labours, well not quite so fresh from laying down, <laughs> but still at work and still energetic. You can't stop law reformers, they keep going on and they keep boring away at this bone to make sure that uh, something comes of it all. Um, when it started in the ALRC, um, we uh, had a lot of challenges, but we had some very good things going for us. The first was the passage of the legislation through the federal parliament with the support of all parts of the parliament, and that was not all that common back in 1974, 75. Uh, and the fact that the attorneys general, first of the Fraser government, uh, uh, first of the Whitlam government, Marmel Murphy, and then of the Fraser government, um, Bob Ellicott, were very keenly dedicated to the reform of the law. They were both very practical lawyers with great experience as barristers, uh, and uh, they were um, enthusiastic for law reform. Uh, Lionel Murphy didn't last long because he was appointed to the High Court, but he had laid down a number of early references and he had uh, proposed a number of other reforms which were then going through the Federal Parliament being parts of the new administrative law uh, which became, as Malcolm Fraser said, the aspect, one of the aspects of his administration of which he was most proud. Uh, but uh, I was appointed uh, and um, I must confess to you that I wasn't all that enthusiastic to be appointed. I'd just been appointed a Deputy President of the Australian Conciliation and Arbitration Commission. People today don't know what a powerful body that was in Australia, uh, the second federal court to be established in 1904 uh, and with very great power in the land, uh, including on issues of the payment of proper salaries to Aboriginal Australians and to women. Uh, and uh, then I was seconded to work in the ALRC. Uh, and we found that we had to approach the matter with a view to ensuring that our work, all our labours and all our energy uh, which was very devoted with all these highly talented people uh, was not wasted. And so uh, we uh, had to consider how we would do the job. And I was always interested in the methodology of law reform uh, and worked very closely with my colleagues in setting down the procedures of the ARC. One of the things we insisted upon from the beginning was public consultation. Uh, we didn't think law reform should be done only by lawyers sitting in a back room 
trying to work out what they thought needed to be done. We thought it should be done with uh, the assistance uh, of the community. We believed that this would not only provide us occasionally with useful ideas, uh, but even if it didn't produce many ideas, it was right in principle that we should consult the people and doing so would build up an expectation and a knowledge about our work that uh, would lead uh, to progress. Very early in the piece, I spoke to uh, the um, Secretary of the Federal Attorney General's Department, uh, Mr. Later Sir Clary Harders. He was a very wise uh, federal um, departmental head. And I said to him, we've had a long discussion about this and we think, contrary to what we had earlier believed, that the ALRC should move from Sydney to Canberra so we could be extremely close, very close to the Attorney General's Department. In fact, we said, we think it might be a good idea if we were, as the modern word is, embedded in the Federal Attorney General's Department so that we could be close to the uh, political arm and to you and to your officials and to make sure that uh, the proposals we put forward would be carried forward. Uh, Sir Clary, who was a very pseudo diffident man, uh, and he said to me, well, that is an idea, that is an idea. <laughs> I knew that worse was to come. <laughs> and he said, uh, but you may need to think about the question of whether if you were embedded in my department and if you were so close to us in Canberra, uh, somebody might say, if they're embedded and they're so close, why are they not gobbled up? <laughs> and why are they not uh, simply part of the Attorney General's department uh, where we can direct what should be done and ensure that things are done as we wish? And on further reflection, I rush back to my comments <laughs> and we had deep and meaningful discussions about it, so we withdrew that proposal. <laughs> and I think it is a good thing that the ALRC is not in Canberra and keeps its independence uh, and is at a distance. I think it's a good thing that the uh, Commission works in consultation with the public. In fact, the model of consulting with the public, which has been the keystone of the work of the ALRC, was an idea I took with me to Geneva when I was appointed to be the chair of the Commission of Inquiry of the Human Rights Council of the United Nations on North Korea. No one had ever had public hearings in a Commission of Inquiry of the United Nations. But I told them, in the Anglo-American legal tradition, you do inquiries in public. That raises uh, an expectation that things will happen and it lets the public know and the public follows it through. And that's what we did in North Korea and that is uh, a common theme of how the ALRC has done the courts. Now, the commissioners who were appointed uh, were extremely talented uh, they were full-time and part-time commissioners. One of the steps that was taken by Lionel Murphy and followed by Bob Ellicott was to use the provision in the Act for the appointment of part-time commissioners. And quite a number of them were judges, federal and state. And the judges liked being part-time commissioners and working in the commission. It gave them a respite from the sometimes tedious work of a judge uh, with exciting insights into the law and was good for their judging. And it certainly attracted some of the best judges in Australia, Chief Justice French, Chief Justice Kiefel, uh, and many judges of the federal court served as part-time commissioners. It is a fact that today there are two part-time commissioners and there is only one full-time commissioner, and that is the president, uh, Justice Derrin Sarah Derrington, uh, but um, the idea of utilising the talent in the law 
uh, which you could get at a very cheap price <laughs> and, and using uh, very talented people was good for them and good for us and it produced reports of great excellence. Unfortunately, the story in recent years has not been an entirely good one. That is a, an understatement of which Sir Clary Harders would be very proud. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a good one because um, the appointment of commissioners has fallen away. At the moment, there's just uh, Justice Sarah Derrington and two part-time commissioners. The appointment, the provision of, uh, of uh, tasks to commission by reference from the government has fallen away. The number of reports that are produced has necessarily fallen away. The budgetary subventions has distinctly fallen away. And all of this is described uh, in uh, what can only be called a slightly more critical uh, paper which I wrote, which is published in the Australian Law Journal, the volume 91 in 2017, The Decline and Fall of Australia's Law Reform Institutions. Uh, and uh, I added a postscript uh, with more optimism than I felt at the end of my article and the prospects of revival. Uh, the appointment of commissioners uh, has fallen. In the, in the 1980s, there were 13 full-time appointments as commissioners and 17 <coughs> part-time. Uh, in the 2010s, there were four full-time commissioners and four part-time. And this is a sign of how things have really declined uh, in the number of personnel. You can't do law reform seriously and your concerted work uh, is much more limited if you don't have uh, a certain level of participation. And uh, at the moment, with one commissioner full-time, two part-time, that is just not really a serious approach to uh, law reform. Uh, similarly, with the number of reports, uh, uh, if you look at the number of reports uh, as described in the annual reports of the Commission over the years since 1975, Australia's, uh, the ALRC, has uh, results that are better than most law reform bodies in the world, but uh, that hasn't uh, ensured the continuance of the enthusiasms of those early days. Uh, I even drew a graph, uh, and you can do this quite easily nowadays with uh, new technology, uh, showing the decline of the funding of the ALRC. And that has also been extremely disappointing. Uh, but today, when I came here, I thought I would ask uh, Justice Sarah Derrington, what about the implementation and the strike rate, and what about the attitude of the uh, government, the Attorney General, to the implementation. What's happened uh, to the family law proposal? No response. What's happened, I say no response from the government, not from Justice Derrick. <laughs> <laughs> what's happened, what's happened, what's happened to the court and the shockingly high rates of incarceration of our indigenous people? Uh, no response mm -hmm. from the government. What's happened to the aged care report, well, there's, it's now been found out to another inquiry that's going on at the moment. Uh, and um, uh, there's really no effective response to that as well. So I don't mean to be um, nasty about all this. This is simply the fact of the matter, the plain statistics. It's very important the legal profession and the judiciary should know about this because if you look at law reform as a kind of auditing and improvement system for the whole legal um, profession and its work, um, uh, a systems and order expert would regard it as a disgrace that our country spends so little uh, and then uh, when it gets reports 
uh, establish another report, the report on the report on the report, mm -hmm. and doesn't appoint sufficient numbers of commissioners uh, and doesn't uh, follow up. So uh, it's in these circumstances that it's quite sensible for the ALRC to look at what can we do to make sure that we have a program that is going to be useful to the parliament whom we served and useful to successive governments who may have different philosophies and attitudes, uh, not a waste of the taxpayers' money, but is uh, supremely useful to the citizens of Australia uh, to reform uh, and modernise the law. And that's why uh, this uh, inquiry uh, was established uh, with the examination of what principles should apply uh, in these questions and also a suggestion of a program which should follow. Now, uh, some people have said to me, oh, we're all at tenterhooks to see what, uh, which of the program items you favour. Well, I'm too long in the tooth and too experienced an old timer in dealing with these issues. There's no way I'm going to cut across and interfere with uh, the program of the Commission. And in any case, nothing can be done without a reference from the Attorney General. I have to say that when we were looking at the early days of the ALRC, <coughs> we had the model of the English Law Commission under Lord Scarman. And we worked very closely and had good relations with Lord Scarman. Uh, but we thought our system of references was a better system because of the fact that it meant a government had to put its mind to it and give a tick, and that authorised the report. But uh, it seems that doing that is itself not enough. And so the ALRC has gone through what it says are the principles that should govern uh, the provision of references to the ALRC in the hope that this will guide successive governments to uh, the <coughs> projects that should be assigned to the ALRC. And I think that's a very good initiative and it's been done in the classic, I would almost say iconic ALRC technique of consultation, surveys, investigation and, and uh, ensuring that it has the best data possible. The first principle, in terms of principle, is jurisdiction, because if you don't have jurisdiction, you should be looking to something uh, that will be within federal jurisdiction or might be. Stability uh, and independence, uh, effectiveness, something that the ALRC can do better than the Attorney General's Department, or a Royal Commission, or a special inquiry, or yet another inquiry on the inquiry. Um, the, the issue of impact. And my feeling about impact is that small is good, big is risky, uh, and medium is perfect. If you look at small, we had in these earliest days the report on complaints against police, alcohol laws uh, for driving in the ACT, human tissue transplantation throughout Australia and um, the privacy and the federal census. All of those were small contained projects useful to government uh, but appropriate to a Law Reform Commission and they were quickly put into operation. Big is risky but sometimes you need a body that will uh, work in consultation and take on a big project such as uh, the issue of privacy dealt with in ALRC 32, uh, evidence in ALRC 38, uh, and even Aboriginal customary law, which I always think provided the zeitgeist that led to the decision in Marbo against Queensland, uh, number two. Uh, medium, uh, however, is perfect, and I would nominate there ALRC 24 on foreign state immunity, which was led by uh, Judge uh, James Crawford, now a judge of the, of the, of the uh, International Court of Justice. 
uh, ALRC 20, insurance contracts. What a fine report that is. And that was done in the closest consultation with the uh, insurance industry and uh, the legal profession. And Article 33, Civil Admiralty. So uh, that they are the perfect projects, things that are not too big to be dangerous and full of problems, but which are big and important uh, and can quickly pass into law. Uh, and the value added that the ALRC offers is uh, its legal technical skills and its public and uh, community consultations. Um, so um, I think the list of criteria uh, are excellent. I think the happening of this investigation on criteria is good, but in the end, and at the bottom line, the ALRC really needs champions. It needs champions in Parliament. It needs champions on both sides of the aisle. It needs to cultivate champions without getting too close to politics. But it does need champions. It needs a return of the spirit that motivated uh, Lionel Murphy and Robert Ellicott. And somehow we have to try and rebuild that in the interests uh, of our country and of law and its future in the country. So I have much pleasure in launching the Future of Law Reform, a suggested program of work. As citizens of this country, we cannot be satisfied with the situation that exists at the moment. It is not acceptable. It is not acceptable. And it has to change. And this document gives an approach that successive attorneys general, because they're all like all of us, just journeymen, working for a time, uh, the ideas by which they can rebuild the ALRC into the great national institution that it deserves to be. So I launched the book, and I now call on uh, the, the secretary. Is that your office, Michael? Principal legal officer. Principal legal officer to uh, follow up and tell us exactly what the ALRC is going to do. Um, I will uh, be briefly thanking uh, a few of the people who have importantly contributed to this project uh, before I uh, dive into the topics themselves that have made it onto the list of the suggested program of work for the next five years. Um, firstly, the report itself, a number of people have remarked how stylish uh, it's looking and the associated paraphernalia. Uh, thank you very much to uh, Nadine Davidson Wells, who's uh, with us this afternoon, who uh, has done the design work. Uh, and the, the printing of the reports, and we're happy to announce she's also our newest recruit and will be starting with us uh, early in the new year. So welcome aboard and thank you very much Nadine for all that hard work. Uh, thank you also to Claudine Kelly, who's still here, uh, just out the back of the Executive Support Officer for making all the arrangements for today. Uh, run so smoothly, thank you. Uh, we've heard a bit about the process, the research that's gone into this, the consultations. We wanted to thank uh, Professor Jeff Giddings uh, and students at Monash University who undertook some of the preliminary research at the start of the project to scan the legal landscape and see what suggestions have been made. Um, also, Professor Simon Rice and students and other academics at the University of Sydney who undertook uh, literature reviews of some of the shortlisted topics to help us narrow in on uh, some of the topics that would make it into the final program of work. Um, also, we have this evening uh, Associate Professor Peter Billings with us who conducted his own consultations as well uh, and uh, collated submissions from a number of experts and practitioners in migration law. Thank you very much uh, for that, Peter. Uh, and really, this exercise it was about sifting, going through hundreds of ideas through seminars, surveys, consultations, and uh, sifting them or boiling them down to this final uh, five, uh, which inevitably means that many uh, have been left behind along the way, but that does not mean that they are less important. There are a number which are of real significance. I think the key criteria really has been suitability out of the list that we've gone through, what is of interest and utility to government, uh, and what aligns with the core strengths of the ALRC. 
So after all the sifting and boiling, what has been cooked up in the ALRC kitchen? <laughs> the key ingredients in our first tasty offering are <laughs> algorithms and administrative law. Does the, the law need reforming to both facilitate and better regulate the use of automated decision making by government departments? Can the law better provide for outcomes that are fair, transparent and accountable? What kind of human involvement, if any, should be required in government decisions? Participants at our public seminars in particular highlighted the urgency and significance of these questions, emphasising that the use of this software is already prevalent across many government agencies and is only expected to increase over time. So that's first on the menu. Next is principle-based regulation of financial services. This is coming from the Hain Royal Commission, which identified an urgent need to simplify and, ra and rationalise the regulation of financial services, clearly identifying the principles which underpin specific provisions. So we've suggested some particular parts of legislation that we could helpfully review to endeavour to try and see how Commissioner Haynes' vision could be implemented in practice. We had a number of submissions expressing concern about the complexity of the legislation and it would build on the work that the ALRC is currently doing in its inquiry on corporate criminal responsibility. Next on the menu, for third course, an old favourite, defamation law. I say it's an old favourite because it was one of the first references given to the ALRC, I believe, back in 1976. And in ALRC's report, it recommended uniform defamation laws, primarily due to the modern forms of communication which were developing at the time. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what it was referring to, but I understand that we accepted uh, around that time submissions by way of something called the Vocadex. Uh, perhaps Mr Kirby or others in the room will remember what that is. Uh, I don't. <laughs> Today, how should defamation laws now operate in our age of digital communications? Would federal legislation be preferable? The ALRC recognises that the Council of Attorneys General is currently looking at defamation laws. An ALRC inquiry could build on that work with a robust, independent and consultative inquiry. A fourth course on the law reform menu, and perhaps if this were a degustation menu, it could be accompanied by a hearty Shiraz. <laughs> the ALRC suggests an inquiry into press freedom and public sector whistleblowers. Are reforms necessary to Commonwealth laws to appropriately protect public interest journalistic activity? Are existing laws adequate to protect whistleblowers in the public service? We're all familiar with particular events that have given rise to heightened controversy this year, and a large number of submissions called for a review on related issues such as human rights, free speech, national security, transparent and accountable government. A careful and considered independent review of relevant laws would appear timely. Finally, for dessert, we've suggested an inquiry into corporate structures for social enterprises. For those who are unaware, as I was until recently, Social enterprises are organisations that trade, seek to make a profit, but also are committed to the achievement of environmental or social goals. We often describe as hybrid organisations caught between the regulatory, regulatory world, worlds of uh, for-profit and not-for-profit entities. There's currently no dedicated co corporate structure for social enterprises in Australia, unlike in many overseas jurisdictions. So is a new dedicated corporate structure desirable in Australia? Could existing corporate structures be adapted? How might the law better facilitate social impact investing, which has been identified as a priority for government? This topic was raised in a smaller number of submissions, perhaps, than the others, but could potentially contribute to the achievement of much larger goals, such as environmental protection. And environmental law was proportionately the most popular law reform topic amongst respondents to our survey. Environmental law itself ultimately ended up in Chapter 3 of our report, which I commend to you for further reading. Uh, it describes eight additional law reform topics that we consider to be of real significance uh, and that could be considered as alternative uh, inquiry topics if any of the primary uh, items on the menu are not to government's taste. I won't go into all those other topics, but briefly on the Australian Constitution. At the start of this project, that was a real focus of the ALRC, reflecting on some of the difficulties we encountered in the family law inquiry. We wondered whether we might helpfully uh, conduct an inquiry into constitutional reform. We got a lot of forcible submissions on this, but we were convinced that the ALRC is not the body to uh, take on a holistic constitutional reform uh, um, process. Instead, there may need to be an independent commission or standing commission uh, set up 
for this purpose, where it can meaningfully engage the public in that process in an ongoing way. And we said Professor George Williams wrote again on this theme just last week in the Australian newspaper. So we hope that our project contributes to reinvigorating the debate around constitutional reform in the face of protracted constitutional stagnation. So the menu is now on the table. We look forward to seeing whether it whets government's appetite for reform. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you also to all of you for coming. It, it is um, hugely gratifying to see the amount of interest that there has been in this project. And I, I hope that, if nothing else, it does provide um, a, a roadmap for the way forward for law reform in this country. Please, will you now um, join us for refreshments outside? Thank you again. Thank you.